Okay, so for our topic for today is torch infections in pregnancy. This is good for uh, those taking or intending to take a part one MRCOG exam. So our discussion will be geared more towards the uh, those who will take the MRCOG one exam. Okay. So when you say torch infection, torch stands for your toxoplasmosis, other infections, rubella, cytomegalovirus, and your herpes simplex virus. For the other infections, you could you can put any other infections here that causes um, a problem in the neonate or in the fetus. Uh, but for this uh, webinar, I chose parvovirus B19. Why? Why did I not choose syphilis? Because I have one whole webinar on syphilis which you can access in our um, YouTube channel, okay? So MedExam Expert YouTube channel. So if you want to learn about syphilis, you, you can just go to the channel, okay? So let's go first to the first um, member of the torch infection, which is your toxoplasmosis. Toxoplasmosis uh, belongs to your parasites. You know, we have the two different um, classifications of parasites, you have your protozoa and helminths. Uh, your toxoplasmosis belongs in the sporozoids. So what are these protozoans? Protozoans are further subclassified into amoeba, flagellates, ciliates, and sporozoans. Uh, they are classified according to their means of locomotion. For example, your amoebas, they move by using their pseudopods or false feet. Your flagellates move by using their flagella. Your ciliates move by using their cilia and your sporozoas, they don't move at all, they are immobile. And your toxoplasma gondii belongs to these sporozoas. So what is toxoplasma gondii? Toxoplasma gondii is, is the one that causes the disease toxoplasmosis. Okay, usually it doesn't cause disease. However, uh, once your immune system is weakened, uh, then you can get infection or sometimes newborns who are born to the mother with infection during pregnancy can get toxoplasmosis. So this is your toxoplasmosis gondii life cycle. Uh, your definitive host belongs to the family of domestic and wild cats, your Philidae family. No other host can pass on the toxoplasma except your cats. That's why we advise pregnant women, if they have um, pets, cat pets, not to change litter boxes or don't get in contact with the cat feces. So for, this, for the life cycle of your toxoplasma gondi, uh, just look at the illustration. Actually, there are three ways which you can be infected or which uh, pregnant women can be infected. If you go uh, here, look here at a um, hey, wait, huh? If you can follow the arrows, okay, uh, for letter A, you see here the cat passes on the, fe uh, the feces, and then the feces goes to the vegetation. The feces goes to the vegetation and contaminates all the vegetables, and then the rat will eat those vegetation. And this sporulated cyst or asporulated cyst will be converted immediately to your bradyzoids. Once the rat ingests this veg vegetation, the oocyst develops into tachyzoids and then develops into bradyzoids. Okay, and then when your cat eats the rat, so the cycle gets uh, continued. Cycle is over, but it goes on and on and on. Another way where you can be infected is when this vegetation or the contaminated vegetation is eaten by other animals like your pig, your your buffalo, your sheep, your chicken. So when they eat this vegetation, these uh, sporulated osis will again be converted into tachyzoids, and then they will be converted into bradyzoids in the, in the neural and muscle tissue. And once you eat these animals that, eat, that ate this uh, contaminated vegetation, then you will become infected. And then that's another cycle. The third cycle is once you eat this contaminated vegetation directly, so when you eat the vegetation, the vegetables, then you will have uh, sporulated cysts converted into your tachyzoids. And these tachyzoids are the ones that you pass on to your fetus if you are pregnant. 
And, and also, once you get blood transfusion, the form that is transmitted to you is in the form of the tachyzoid, okay? So as I've mentioned, humans can be infected in several ways by eating undercooked meat from animals that are infected with tissue cysts by the fecal oral route, rats placentally from mother to fetus, and by blood transfusion from infected person. So your, your mode of transmission could be foodborne, zoonotic, or congenital. So maternal infection in the third trimester is more likely to result to fetal infection, but their cause is usually in a parent clinically. That means you don't feel anything except for maybe gastric upset or um, uh, flu-like symptoms, okay? Uh, we all know that toxo-IgM is not a part of your antenatal screening, okay? You should remember this. Your toxoplasma IgM in pregnant women is not diagnostic. So when, 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 you, when you encounter an exam a question that says, which of these are included in your antenatal screen, don't ever choose toxoplasmosis because toxoplasmosis is not routinely done in the UK, okay? So that's for exam, exam point of view. But I know some of you are, who are practicing uh, in the Middle East, we still do this, right? Like me, I'm here in Saudi Arabia. So we still do this in, in pregnant patients as a part of our routine screening. However, if in the UK and in the purpose of the exam, you only do toxoplasmosis once you have a clear history that the patient has exposure to, to, fat, uh, to cat feces, okay? If there's no exposure and if the patient did not volunteer to you that information, then you don't have to routinely check for the toxoplasma IgM. So what is the treatment? The treatment is avoidance of eating contaminated uh, vegetables. So you have to make sure that the meat is thoroughly cooked and you wash your hands after touching raw meat. For pregnant women who has uh, pet cats, you should not clean litter boxes and avoid contact with cat feces, as I've mentioned in the previous slide. So for pregnant women, what is the treatment? We have your spiramycin and sulfonamide, okay? But these drugs, um, they, don't, they only reduce the severity of the infection. They are not, uh, especially if you started this medication late in the trimester, we, I will give you an algorithm later on. If you start the, the medication late in the trimester, then probably your, your fetus will already be infected. Okay, so this is just for the prevention of uh, adverse uh, outcome. So this is the algorithm uh, which I'm talking about. So your pregnant women, okay, here, when you suspect a pregnant woman to have acquired acute toxoplasmosis during gestation, first you determine what uh, age of gestation she is in. If she is less than 18 weeks, you can start spiramycin. If she is more than 18 weeks, you can start pyramethamine, sulfidiacin, and folinic, folinic acid, okay? And how do, you, how do you confirm if there's an infection? You have to do amniotic fluid PCR in both situations, more than 18 weeks of gestation, okay? Or soon, if it is feasible. And then you have to do your ultrasound every four weeks until the delivery. So you see how, how toxic it is. You have to do it every four weeks. And what you should look for in ultrasound, you have to look for ascites, hepatosplenomegaly, in the fetus, okay? If your AF PCR is negative and you don't see any ultrasound abnormality in the fetus, you can continue spiramycin until delivery to prevent any adverse uh, effect during the pregnancy. But you still have to continue monitoring by ultrasound until delivery. In another scenario, um, if you started the patient with pyramethamine and sulfadiacin and folinic acid, and it turns out that your amniotic fluid PCR is negative, okay, you could either switch to spiramycin or you can continue with pyrimetamine, okay, this one. But still, you have to continue fetal monitoring until delivery, okay? So if your AFPCR is positive, whether she come from this group or this group, you have to shift the patient into pyrimetamine and sulfadiacin, okay? Uh, this management uh, usually doesn't come out in the MRCOG part one exam. Usually they will ask you this, 
in part two, MRCOG, and uh, part three, okay? So let's move on. So this is the, the features of your congenital toxoplasmosis. The risk of uh, transplacental transmission from mother to fetus is greater in the last trimester. Okay, remember this, in the last trimester. trimester. So patient could either present with birth defects, severe, hydrocephalus, retinal damage, neurodevelopmental deficit, seizures, deafness, okay? So that's it for your toxoplasmosis. Uh, now let's go to your O. And as I've mentioned, I will tell you, uh, I will discuss with you parvovirus instead of syphilis. So your O for this session uh, stands for parvovirus. Your parvovirus B19 is everything in bold uh, letters are important for the MRCOG1 exam, okay? So your parvovirus B19 is the only uh, genus of parvovirus that infects humans, okay? The rest of the parvovirus uh, uh, species, they infect canines or the dogs, okay? And it is, it, it is important to note that all of your uh, DNA viruses are double-stranded except for your parvovirus. So your parvovirus B19 is the only single-stranded DNA virus, okay? It is a naked virus with icosahedral capsid, and the disease that it causes is your fifth disease, or otherwise known as your erythema infectiosum, or your slap cheek syndrome. So this is your slap cheek syndrome, and this is your lace-like extremities. So you will see this in, um, in a patient with a parvovirus infection. There's one publication that um, publishes uh, all the rashes that is present in pregnancy, and parvovirus are, uh, is among them, okay? So when you encounter a rash during pregnancy, uh, you should think of parvovirus, uh, rubella, some of your torch infection, okay? Varicella, cytomegalovirus, we will go, that, we will go to it uh, later on. So parvovirus B19, as I've mentioned, is the only human pathogenic parvovirus. It causes erythema infectiosum, also known as your fifth disease or your slap cheeks disease, okay? Uh, what is the other um, virus, DNA virus, that causes um, uh, erythema in your pregnant women or rashes? Oh, sorry. Anyone? What causes your erythema nodosum? Okay, the cause of your erythema nodosum is your mycobacterium, okay? So as I've mentioned, parvovirus B19 is the only single-stranded DNA virus. It is spread by respiratory droplets. So important, important. Incubation is four to 20 days. Some books say four to 21 days. So it doesn't matter. One day difference, it doesn't matter. It replicates in the RBC precursor of your bone marrow. Adults are more, more often present with swelling. And uh, just give me a minute, okay? Sorry for the interruption. Okay, so because it's a Friday here, so there's a lot of things going on. Um, so the incubation is four to 20 days, as I have mentioned. Um, some books, it says four to 21 days. 60% of women are immune to parvovirus. The overall miscarriage risk is six to 12%. Uh, for part one MRCOG, um, percentages are not very, very important. But for part two MRCOG, you have to know the uh, percentages. It causes hydroxyphetalis, 3%, due to fetal anemia. Why does it has fetal anemia? Because it replicates in the RBC precursors in the bone marrow, so it causes anemia. It does not cause congenital defect, therefore it is not indicated for termination of pregnancy. 
So that means if you if a pregnant patient uh, got infected with parvovirus, um, it is not a reason for her to terminate the pregnancy because it does not cause congenital defects. Okay, it causes this is important. It causes a plastic crisis in patients with sickle cell disease. This is important. Because you should remember that because it's an outright exam question. And fetal transmission is 30% mainly in the first trimester. So what is, what is the treatment of your parvovirus B19? The treatment is intrauterine fetal blood transfusion. Okay. So now let's go to the third. If you have any question, just raise your hand or just uh, unmute yourselves. Okay. But if everything is clear, I will proceed. proceed okay. So your third um, disease under torch is your rubella. Okay, rubella also causes rash in pregnancy. So rubella uh, belongs to your toga viridae. It is known as your German measles. It is the only species under the genus rubivirus. Okay, it is a single-stranded RNA, positive sense envelope, icosahedral capsids. You know my students in the course. I teach them how to memorize the DNA viruses, the RNA viruses in one sitting. Okay, and I'm very, very proud of, of, of these students in the regular course. I hope you join us, in the, uh, join us in our crash course so that I can also share with you those mnemonics. Okay, so it is a single-stranded positive sense envelope, icosahedral capsid. The transmission is also respiratory droplets. The fetomaterial transmission rate, as opposed to your um, parvovirus, transmission is more in the first trimester. Remember, in the parvovirus, more in the in the later latest trend, uh, later trimester. Okay, the transmission decreases after 16 weeks. Okay, first trimester, uh, first trimester, 90% of infected fetus have congenital defects. In the second trimester, only 20% of infected fetus. So the minimal risk uh, is once the pregnancy get past of uh, 16 weeks age of gestation. Okay, when it goes beyond 20 weeks, there is no risk, no increased risk for congenital anomaly. So this is your congenital anomaly, uh, rubella triad syndrome. Okay, so we you have your manifestations like your eye, cataract, glaucoma. You have your heart defects, PDA, VSD, pulmonary stenosis. You have your sensory neural hearing loss, and you have your hematologic manifestation. Okay, so. Let me just here compare uh, side by side. What other um, congenital uh, infection causes sensory neural hearing loss? If I have a student here, what other virus causes sensory neural hearing loss? Anyone can answer. Anyone? CMV. Very good. CMV. Is the other uh, uh, virus that causes con sensory neural hearing loss. So how will you choose in the exam, whether it is CMV or uh, rubella? Of course, the scenario will give you, okay? The, uh, the situation will give you. Usually for CMV, they will not mention to you congenital cataract or a heart problem. And in the scenario, they will, they will tell you that the patient is usually asymptomatic uh, the mother only experiences flu-like symptoms, and then the baby came out to have congenital defect. In the cytomegalovirus infection, which will, I will explain to you in the next uh, slide, uh, most of the neonate infected with CMV are asymptomatic, and only 10% are symptomatic. Okay? So rubella somehow shares features with your CMV. So now let's go to your C, which is your cytomegalovirus. Cytomegalovirus is caused by your human herpes virus 5, okay? It is the causative agent of your mononucleosis syndrome, okay? So I want to stress here that there is another uh, virus belonging to your herpes virus group that causes your infectious mononucleosis. Infectious mono. So this is not the same as your mononucleosis syndrome. The cause of your infectious mono is your Epstein-Barr virus, which is your human purpose virus 4. Okay? So don't confuse. 
And usually, your CMV presents with ALS eye inclusion body. So let me proceed with my slide. Okay, so uh, CMV is actually preventable. As mentioned by the National CMV Foundation, just like your toxoplasmosis, you can avoid getting infected by your CMV. How? How do you get uh, prevent? How can you prevent being affected by by CMV? Uh, CMV is transmitted by neonates, okay, or your toddlers or your babies. That's why CMV is very very common in home and daycare setting. So if a pregnant woman has a toddler, if she oftentimes kisses this toddler in the lips and she uses the utensils of this baby, there's a high risk chance that uh, she will be infected with CMV. As, I, as we have mentioned that once the your neonates carry the CMV virus, it is usually the baby is usually asymptomatic, but they are spreading the virus. They spread the virus using, uh, through their urine and saliva. So how do you prevent it? Avoid contact with saliva. Don't kiss kids under the age of five. Kiss them on the forehead instead of the lips. And don't share utensils, drinks, or toothbrushes with kids under the age of five. Wash your hands after contact with bodily fluids. That means when your baby uh, pass out urine, you have to change the diaper. So avoid contact or wash your hands after changing nappies or diapers, okay? So there's another, wait, there's another uh, infection that causes uh, ALS eye inclusion body. Uh, this is your Hodgkin lymphoma. This is your ALS eye. Okay, sorry for the markings, but I can no longer remove it. Okay, wait. Okay, so this is your ALS eye inclusion, if you see the histopath. Okay, under the microscope. And this is how your CMV baby um, uh, presents. This is what we call blueberry muffin rash. Okay, so this is pathognomonic of your CMV infection. So usually they say a patient with blueberry muffin rash think of CMV. However, uh, all your torch infection can cause blueberry muffin rash. Okay, just remember that. Okay. So for the epi epidemiology, uh, out of all your torch infection or out of all your um, viruses, uh, CMV has a lot of percentages. So you have to at least uh, know this by one reading. So remember that your fetal maternal transmission rate is 40% irrespective of the age of gestation. If we mention that your rubella has 90% uh, mother-to-child transmission during the first trimester, and your toxoplasmosis and your parvovirus, usually in the last trimester, then your CMV can be transmitted at any age of gestation with a rate of transmission of 40%, okay? It causes outright exam question, also came out in the recall, 10% causes symptoms in 10% of infected infants. Incubation period is three to 12 weeks, okay? So another tip is, uh, you don't have to memorize all of the incubation period for part one exam, okay? But you have to memorize the incubation period of your DNA viruses, DNA viruses, and your rubella, okay? So DNA viruses, you only have six. You only have six DNA viruses. So memorize the incubation period of those DNA viruses and also your rubella and your toxoplasma, okay? So 95%, as I mentioned, 95% of pregnant women are asymptomatic. May, they may present only with fever, malay, lymph lymphadenopathy, uh, or any flu-like symptoms, okay? For the fetus, the, um, how do you know that the patient is infected with CMV? So you have to test for your culture or your PCR of the amniotic fluid after 20 weeks of gestation. And for the mothers, you have to check for CMV, IgM, and IgG. However, this is again, like your tox toxoplasmosis, this is not a routine part of your antenatal care. If you only suspect you see a patient with the rash presenting during pregnancy, uh, you get the history. And if it is veering towards CMV, then you can do your CMV serology. Okay. However, don't do this to all your pregnant women because it is not routinely recommended in the UK or 
anywhere, okay? So your CMV associated congenital defects, uh, I, I, I tell my course student, don't read, just look at the drawing. Okay, so let's look at the drawing. So this is your congenital, congenital toxomegalovirus infection. You will have, the baby will have chorioretinitis, a small for gestational age. You see the baby is uh, jaundice, so you will have jaundice. Baby will also have petechiae or purpura, okay? And microcephaly, okay? And also, uh, pathognomonic of your CMV is your hepatosplenomegaly. And the delayed reaction is your sensory neural hearing loss here. Okay? So, if you want to read the, the wordings, so IUGR, microcephaly, hepatosplenomegaly, thrombocytopenia, represented by your petechiae and purpura, jaundice, chorioretinitis, and your late developing sequelae, which is your psychomotor retardation and your sensory neural hearing loss. Okay, one primary maternal infection, 40% of fetus will be infected. 10%, remember, 10% are only symptomatic. And out of this 10%, 33% will die and will have long-term problems. Okay? So when the exam scenario tells you sensory neural hearing loss, think of CMV and rubella. Uh, and the uh, rubella, they always uh, uh, couple it with the uh, heart problem and uh, cataracts, okay? So please note also that your gancyclovir here, just like your spiramycin in toxoplasmosis, your gancyclovir doesn't prevent the congenital infection. It only protects the baby against loss of hearing. Okay, development, developmental impairment. Okay, so now let's go to the last uh, virus under torch infection. This is your herpes simplex virus. A very important and favorite exam question in all parts of uh, MRCOG. So your herpes virus belongs to your human herpes virus one, two, three, four, and five. So you have five. Uh, human herpes virus, actually there are eight, okay, but only, there are 130 uh, human herpes virus strain, only eight are, are significantly important to humans, but uh, we will discuss this he here in this webinar, only the first two, okay, we discussed already your CMV, so we will discuss your first two, HSV1, HSV2. So we all know that your HSV1 is the cause of your oral labial herpes, right? And your HSV2 is the cause of your uh, genital herpes. Okay? We also have your herpetic whitlow. When you say herpetic whitlow, this is the herpes infection that you can find in your hands. And when you say herpes gladiatorum, this is a very rare type of herpes of virus infection that is common among um, wrestlers or those who have uh, um, contact sports. Okay. So we mentioned that your HSV1 causes your orolabial herpes or your anything, any infection above the waist, and your HSV2 causes your genital infection or anything below the waist. But this was previously, okay? Uh, your HSV2 also causes genital herpes 30% of the time, but most of them 70%. This was before, again, I repeat, this is previously, okay? Now, the most common cause of your genital herpes is your HSV2, uh, HSV1, sorry. So HSV1 is now the most common cause of your genital herpes in the UK, okay? So if the exam question asks you, uh, what is the most, uh, what, what herpes virus infection causes your uh, genital herpes, automatically you will think it is HSV2. That was previously, but now, uh, HSV1 causes the most is the most common cause of your orolabial and your genital herpes. Okay, so remember that HSV1 for both of your orolabial and your genital herpes. Your HSV2 is on, now only historically the most common cause of anogenital. He's, it's a history now. Okay, the most common cause now is your HSV1. Okay, I hope that is clear. So how do we diagnose herpes? By clinical 
clinical demonstration of the lesion. It could either be in your genitals or in your mouth. Uh, you can also use a swab. The gold standard is still your PCR. And you can also test using your nucleic acid amplification test. So how do you manage herpes? Okay, unfortunately, as I've told my regular course student, there is no cure for herpes. Okay. But you can have relief of symptoms like simple analgesia, saline bathing, and topical anesthetic. And you, you have an antiviral regimen so to prevent uh, adverse uh, effects. Okay, You cannot cure it. It remains with you. It just go dormant. It just go latent. But it will never leave your body once you have it. Okay, so a cyclovir, 400 milligram, three times a day for five days, is the treatment of your herpes. Okay, and you have your alternative regimen, valacyclovir, and this should be started within five days of infections while lesions are still forming. Okay, incubation of your herpes is uh, two to seven days. As some book says, it is um, two to fourteen. Okay. So this is your algorithm for your uh, treat, uh, management of your herpes. First, you have to determine whether you get primary or recurrent herpes. Okay. Uh, in any type, whether it is primary or recurrent, you have to give your oral acyclovir. Okay. So remember, primary or recurrent, you have to give oral acyclovir, 400 milligram three times a day for five days. Okay. And then if you have recurrent herpes, uh, give a cyclovir and then offer them vaginal delivery. Okay, single course. If you have primary and, is, and your patient is less than 28 weeks, so you give this course of oral acyclovir 400 three times a day for five days and then you stop. And then you repeat a cyclovir at 30, 36 weeks age of gestation. So that's the only difference between less than 28 and more than 28. If you get the patient at more than 28 weeks, there's no stopping. You start the course and you continue until delivery. So I hope that is clear, okay? So for your primary less than 28 weeks, you can offer vaginal delivery just like your recurrent. But for your, for your um, primary, but more than 28 weeks, you recommend cesarean section. Why? Because uh, the transmission is higher if you got primary a herpes infection in the later part of your pregnancy. Uh, the transmission is 41%. That's why we rec recommend cesarean section. But for your recurrent, the transmission is 0 to 3%. That's why we offer vaginal delivery. Okay? However, for example, uh, another point here is if your patient doesn't want oral acyclovir, uh, doesn't want cesarean section, sorry. If they don't want cesarean section and they insist on vaginal delivery, you have to give the mother IV acyclovir, five milligram per kilogram every eight hours, and you have to give the neonate, inform the pediatrician to give acyclovir 20 milligram per kilogram every eight hours, okay? So this is your uh, complication of uh, herpes uh, infection in pregnancy. You'll have your neonatal herpes. So these uh, figures is very important. 30% will, will cause localized skin, eye, or mouth infection. 60% will cause localized CNS. And 70% will cause disseminated disease or CNS infection. So as I've mentioned, primary HSV infection in, uh, is 41% transmission. That's why we recommend cesarean section. And recurrent HSV infection, we only have 0 to 3%. That's why we recommend vaginal delivery. So we recommend cesarean section, especially if the mother got primary infection within six weeks before delivery, or if there is a rupture of membrane more than four hours. And again, remember, don't use your fetal scalp electrode if there is active lesion. Okay? So is everything clear? We have few questions to answer. I hope uh, that you will participate. Do you have any question in the torch infection in pregnancy? If there's none, now let's go to the question and answer portion. 
What is the incubation period of your CMV? If you listen to the lecture or the webinar, anyone? Anyone? Two to three weeks. Another answer? Anyone with another answer? Do you all agree it's two to three weeks? Your answer here is three to 12 weeks, okay? Three to 12 weeks for your CMV infection. What is the incubation period for your rubella? Twelve to twenty-three days. Very good. It's twelve to twenty-three days. Thank what you. is the positive? Thank you. What is the causative organism of your toxoplasmosis? Option C. Toxoplasma gondi. Correct. Very good. Which of the following describes your toxoplasma gondi? Intercellular protozoan. Very good. So choice E. Which one of the congenital infection is most characteristically associated with fetal hydrops? Parvovirus. Parvovirus. Very good. So that ends our webinar. If you have any question regarding the crash course, any question uh, regarding the webinar, uh, feel feel free to open your microphones. In the crash course, uh, Anum explained to you that uh, we will be having live sessions. And in the live sessions, uh, it is not a lecture type of discussion. It is uh, like question and answer and uh, rationalization. So you don't have to, to know the key to the, to the recall question because we will be providing to you the keys and the explanation why it is the best answer for that question. Okay, so if you, if you want to, to enroll in the crash course, our, uh, it will start on December 3, the first session. Dr. Helmi will, will start it. And then I will be um, having the next session on uh, biostatistics statistics workshop. If you in, enroll in the crash course, uh, biostatistics workshop is included in the crash course. Okay, so it's a very, very big discount. And I think today, you have a special discount of $89. So if you have any question, just uh, send message to our team and they, they will be there to answer all your queries, okay?